Hello. Uh, we just want to thank uh, the pastor for this opportunity to share the word of God with you. And we just want to say greetings and peace to all of uh, our congregation. I want to thank you all for tuning in to uh, listen to what the word of God would have to say to us. And I would like to thank those that are in prayer uh, for this, uh, this occasion and also for the support from uh, our ministers, uh, the elders, Elder Willis and Elder Armstrong, and also our sister, Minister Mary Tillman, and my brother, Brother Cedric Harden. I want to thank you all, and we don't take this opportunity for granted. With that said, I would like to pause for a word of prayer. Eternal God, our Creator, our Maker, our Sustainer, we thank you for this day and for this time and this moment that you unfold before us and blessed us with this occasion. And Father, we ask that at this moment that you would speak to us and that we would have our ears prepared to hear what you have to say. And we say through the words of the song, not our way, but yours, and not our will, but your will. Since thou for us did bleed, and now does intercede, each day we simply plead, thy will be done. Now we ask that the words that flow from our mouth would be acceptable unto thee, and that Christ would be glorified. In the name of Almighty God we ask it. Amen. We would like to draw your attention to a familiar passage of scripture. It's from the book of Exodus. And it is the third chapter of Exodus. We will begin at the 13th through the 14th verses. Exodus 3, 13, and 14. And it reads, Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. God said, Thus, you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And therein lies the lesson that God has prepared for us to receive and to understand today. Now I think it's important that we reflect upon that this was not a casual conversation. This wasn't just a, um, we're just shooting the breeze. Uh, this wasn't uh, 20 questions. Uh, uh, this was not just a social gathering and just a regular by the way conversation. But this was an urgent, this was a serious, this was a sincere request, supplication that was made by Moses in the presence of the Spirit of God with a serious, significant issue involved because it was the request of the freedom of an oppressed people. 
of people who were suffering from an oppressive government. And it's ironic that while Moses, understanding the people to whom he would be sent to provide and share the message that was revealed to him in a spiritual form by a bush that was consumed by the Spirit of God. And even though it was on fire, it was not burning. It did not burn incomplete, but it was consumed by the Spirit of God. Now, the ironic part here is, is that while Moses asked for a name, the Spirit gave Moses a phrase. Instead of giving Moses a name, the Spirit revealed unto Moses a phrase. And the phrase was, I am that I am. Now, in some translations, uh, of the Holy Writ, there are some new translations which word it differently and they say, I am who I am, instead of I am that I am. And I want to draw your mind in as we look at the different use of the word who and the word that. In the English language, when who is used, in every case, it is in reference and the use of a pronoun to describe a noun. It serves the place of a noun. But that has multiple purposes and multiple usages. Whereas who is only a pronoun, that can be a determining factor. It can be a relative pronoun. It could be the clause of an object. It could be a complement to a noun or an adjective. It can be the subject of a sentence. It could be a compound conjunction or conjecture. So that has multiple usages and purposes, while who is singular in its function. And the question we must ask ourselves is, are we serving a God that is limited to only one function and one purpose, or do we serve a God that is unlimited, that has multiple purposes and multiple usages? The other factor that I want to bring to our attention is, is that there's so much chaos that is going on in the world today. And I want us to recognize, because a lot of times we find ourselves uh, somewhat conditioned by certain cliches and responses that we make. But I want those to be certain for us because a lot of times we say, God is still in control. God is still on the throne. And certainly that is true. But I want us to look at it from another perspective. I want us to recognize that we are in 2020. And 2020 is a phrase that is used when we identify the visual acuity of our eyesight. 2020 is to determine what is the percentage that our eyes behold. It identifies if we are able to see things close and things from a distance. 
It's usually a distance that is, which, in co which uh, coincides with the 2020, something that is 20 feet from our presence, and are we able to discern what we see from a distance? And I want us to recognize today that this is 2020, and God, the Spirit of God is asking us, do we see? not with our natural eye, but with our spiritual eye. I want us to focus on the fact that we are in an era where many things of the past, tradition and status quo, and things that people want us to receive as this is the norm and it's not going to change. I want us to recognize don't look at what we see with the natural eye, but look at what we see with the spiritual eye to help us to understand that. Romans, the eighth chapter, talks about creation. It talks about what God created without the assistance of mankind. And it said that even creation is groaning as a woman who is painting in birth for the new creation, for the newness of life, because even God's creation has been held in contempt and in bondage by the wickedness of mankind. And the earth has suffered, and now the earth is regurgitating all around the nation and all around the earth. The earth is saying, we are sick of man's wickedness and we are regurgitating back to what man has done, we will not accept it. We are coming into a newness. And just as it is in childbirth, a lot of times even the question of death hovers over the woman as she's given birth. But when the birth process is over, regardless of the pain that it caused, Sometimes things don't settle with mom while she's pregnant and she will even regurgitate what's not acceptable for the new birth that she's bringing. And when this occurs, we might all have to kneel and pray to ask that the birth process is successful. But when it's over, the new life comes and there is enjoyment, excitement, because we have now come into an era of the newness of life. The scripture in Romans the eighth chapter tells us that we were saved by this hope. We were saved because we were hoping in the newness. We were hoping in the end of the status quo. Things as man wants to leave them. But our hope was in not the things that we see, not the corruption that we see, but our hope is in the things that we do not see. And Hebrews tell us that this practice is called faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. We are hoping for deliverance from this foolishness. And the Spirit of God is in the presence of our hope. The Spirit of God is not dead. But many times in our traditional and customary acceptance of the concept of the oppressor, and the God, the oppressor, presented to us. We're still calling God a he. Some of us have become enlightened because of the suppression and degradation of females in this corrupt world we have, and now we refer to God as she. But I want to tell you that God is neither he nor she. God is neither bound nor free. God is neither Jew nor Gentile. No nation, no people can claim the spirit of God 
because nobody created the Spirit of God. Who tells the Spirit what it can and what it cannot be? That is why the scripture said, I am that I am. I minister to you where you are needed, where the need is cited. Now, I want to uh, come back to the concept about the Spirit. And I want Scripture to bear witness to this for me. In the Scripture, Genesis, it's always good when you have problems. It's always good to start at the root of the problem. Don't be blindsided by the branches and the fullness of the tree. Go to the root. Start at the beginning. So we're going to look at Genesis 1 and 2. And this will bear witness to why I'm trying to make a distinction between identifying God as a he. God is not a little gray-haired old man sitting on a chair up in the sky. God is spirit. So in Genesis 2 it said, the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. But the Spirit of God was moving upon the face of the waters. Notice that the scripture said, it didn't say that he was moving upon the face of the waters. It didn't say that she was moving upon the face of the waters. It said the Spirit of God was moving upon the face of the waters and this was in darkness. That's an emphasis that God was trying to tell us right from the beginning. That no matter how dark, how bleak, how dim our situation looks, God did some of his great, some of God's greatest work was done in the darkness. While nobody could even see what God was doing, the Spirit of God was moving. It was being constructive. It was being productive. It was being positive. It was making things happen. It was done in the darkness. While nobody could look at what wondrous works were going to be birthed and come into the light. It teaches us that even though sometimes things look like they're impossible, sometimes things look like they're so bleak, it's a doom hanging over it, that there's no potential or opportunity for any direction or light or positive energy. Just think about it. God created many of the things that we are still in awe of in darkness while no one can even see it. And then here's another thing that God teaches us in his word. In the word of God, it teaches us that the great I am, that I am, is telling us, the scripture says, that which is done in the darkness shall come to the light. And just think about it. After God was moving and constructing and building and, and developing things and creating in the darkness, before the Spirit of God even created the sun, the moon, and the stars, three days later, on the fourth day, the Spirit of God said, let there be light, and light appeared. 
And in the end, it tells us in the book of Revelations that when the new earth and the new heaven come, that there won't be any need for the sun or the moon because the spirit of God will be the light. Now I wanna to move to another point here and I'll be done. I know as ministers, we say that all the time, but I'm serious. Uh, bear with me. There's another factor here that is crucial for us to lift. And that is, sometimes things can look so out of kilter until we begin to think of them as being impossible. We start feeling as though there's not a chance. Uh, the opposition is too great. Uh, this here is just uh, beyond improvement. It can't get no better. But I want you to work with me on this word about being impossible. Now we know from scripture that God, the spirit of God has said unto us that is there anything too hard for God that with man it is impossible, but all things are possible with God. This is not man's word. This is God's word. When the spirit was moving and creating, there was nobody there to tell the spirit what it should do, where it can go, where it can't go, where and who it does dwell in, and who it doesn't dwell in. There was nobody to tell the spirit what to create first, what to create second. There was nobody the spirit had to answer to. There was nobody to tell the spirit, to give the spirit a blueprint, follow these directions, do it in this sequence of operations. There was nobody there but the spirit. But now all of a sudden, man has become so intelligent that now he can tell the spirit where it will go, where it can't go, who it will possess, who is not possessing. It tells the spirit, you can't be for them. You are with us. We own you. They don't. Man has become so stuck on himself that now he thinks he is God. But I'm here to tell you that in the beginning, it was the spirit that did the creation and it had no assistance of no one. No one can tell the spirit what, where, when, how, why. The spirit tells us so this whole issue about being impossible, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. And look at this word impossible. So I want you to work with me on this. Impossible. I am P.O. S-S-I-B-L-E, impossible. Now, when you think about this, I want you to put a hyphen between M and P. So we have possible on this side, we have I am on this side. Now behind the I, put an apostrophe, and then impossible, just simply says, I'm possible. No matter what you come up against, always remember that in every impossibility, I am is possible. I am that I am. I'm always possible, no matter what you face. 
Now, I wanna try and uh, close this up. Time factors, time factors we have. I'm not gonna tell the story about I'm almost done because I haven't even started. We're talking about the I am that I am. If we was here for a thousand years, we would still not have scratched the surface. So I'm not gonna say I'm almost done. I'm just beginning. But I want us to look at this here. So I am told Moses, and if you want to read this verbatim, word for word, if you go to the third chapter of Exodus, I'm going to read it aloud, but you read it in your leisure. The seventh verse, it says, and the Lord, now this, this is the Lord manifested in the presence of a bush that was on fire, but it did not, it was not consumed. See, see, a person can't be in a bush on fire, but a spirit can. So now, the spirit of God said to Moses, it says, and the I am said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. And I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. Now everyone that thinks that God is not listening, why do you think that the earth is doing what it is today? Look at the plagues that beset Egypt and then try to distinguish ourselves here in America from the same plagues that oppress a, that visited upon an oppressive government and enslaved Hebrew people. So just, just do a comparison. The things that are visited upon the earth today is because the spirit has heard the cry of oppressed people and understands our sorrows. Somebody almost acts as though they think God is going to come in some physical form with tanks and armies. Don't you know that God can summon the winds, the waters, the mountains, the valleys, the trees? Don't you know that the environment is under the control of the Spirit of God? Man has material things. God has spiritual things. Okay. So the scripture said that verse uh, uh, 9 says, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the oppressors oppress them with. Don't you ever think that God doesn't hear us? And don't you ever think that the spirit is limited? That was then, this is now. You think that all of these people that are gathering in mass, that somebody sent an email out to them and told them this is the time for us to forget about ourselves, our identity, our status, our, our uh, materialistic matters and individualism, do you think that somebody sent a uh, mail uh, or a, a fax or that somebody broadcasted this 
and cause people of every kindred to come together on the same issues? The scripture says that the spirit of God is what causes us to lose sight of ourselves and recognize that there is a higher call. Now, I want to close out and uh, I want us just to reflect upon this because uh, this was one of the impediments that even though the people were oppressed and they wanted freedom from their oppressor, and they prayed and they cried and they pleaded unto God that if you could bring us out from under this oppressor, that we will serve you forever. Your name will forever be upon the lips of our expressions. And herein lies the impediment. You see, when the Hebrews were freed from oppression, and those that have, are, are Bible scholars and have read and know God's word, you know that the Hebrews, oh, they was excited, they were joyous, you know, they were up and down, it was, oh man, relief, oh, thank God, thank God. But as soon as they got on the other side to show you the influence of the oppressor. As soon as they got on the other side, what did they do? They went right back to what they had been subjected to, to what they cried and pleaded for freedom from. They took those same traditions, those same concepts of God, they took those same customs, they took those same cultural behavioral practices, and as soon as God freed them, they went right over on the other side and they started partying just like they were when they were oppressed. They took the same practices over to the new land. God allowed them to linger for 40 years to get the oppressor out of them before he brought them into the new land. So while we keep talking about we ready for change, we sick and tired of what America is doing. We're tired of the game they play with us. Are you tired enough to get that foolishness out of ourselves? The freedom comes when we free the foolishness out of our minds and out of our spirits. Are you ready for that? God is not freeing us to take materialism from here over there. Sexism from here over there. Individualism, capitalism, all the isms. Now think about it. God is not a figurine, a spirit. Can you imagine how many people have been killed and slaughtered all in the name of a God that has no name? While we're talking about names, I want us to distinguish between names and attributes. The oldest name associated with God in the oldest artifacts that have been recovered is El. 
E L. And as man became more aware of the presence of God, he began to identify his awareness of God by saying that God was El Eon, the strong one. Then he said, well, God is Elohim, the all-powerful creator. Then he got a little bit more aware. He realized that there's no end to this God. So then he called him L-O-M, the eternal everlasting God. And then he started to remember that God was a healer and God was all sufficient and God provided everything. And he said, well, God is El Shaddai. But I want you to recognize here, these are not names. These are the spirit of God manifesting itself to man. And man, all of a sudden, having enough intelligence that was given to him by the spirit of God to recognize the attributes and the manifestations of God. So I have to close at some point. And I want to close here. But I want us to leave with this and to remember that I am because you are and you are because we are and we are because I am. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.